the artist wears only the clothes of main manswear for the duration of, of the exhibition, is currently included in the Hammer Museum's Lake <laughs> Biennial. <laughs> and a related solo show um, is up called Time Machine Hippie Dandy at the Melek Session. Melek City and Birds. Melek City and Birds. Melek City and Birds. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, in Los Angeles. Todd Gray received both his BFA and MFA from the California Institute of the Arts. Uh, Arts. He works in multiple genres, including photo based works as well as sculpture, paintings, and performance. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Yeah. 
Whereas a lot of times I feel like, oh man, I have no good idea to make a game. It's really transformative. I have a whole year of wonderful art making. And, and then I ended up with these thousands of um, photographs, which started you know, as a very sort of dadaist practice, but it really enriched my experience. So it really made me think a lot about the perception of the focus. Once you start you know, focusing on something, how it transforms your experience. So that's what I meant by um, about the experience. And I realized that I'm making art because I want to experience this creative, uh, the joy that comes with the act of creating something, coming up with a new idea. Um, so this was a really wonderful, new, a wonderful year of image making. And um, I have a lot of at some point, I was trying to go look at the, it's just a woman's building in, in Chinatown where we had this big gallery space downstairs and just put it all around the gallery and just try to have a look at it. And I've created a few installations and I am not going to show you those installations, but um, just to talk about the idea of perception and, um, and how it affected me. And another piece from a similar time period is a multifaceted project called Girls Like Me. And what I did was I went around and took photos and videos of women who I thought looked like me. Stop stalking myself. Woman stalks woman. <laughs> I swear sometimes people look at me like, what are you doing? Especially when I videotape people. So I made a couple of installations and I have actually a really fun video piece Again, it was about, um, oh, and then I did a, well, for one of the exhibits, I did a performance where I invited about 25 people um, to perform, so we all dressed in black, and, um, and we sort of, you know, roamed the gallery, but just came together a couple times during the installation, uh, during the opening, just to this circle, and we just talked about our experience and how it felt to be in the performance, and then we parted and then came together again. That was real trippy as an observer because it wasn't announced, and this was. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it, it was real trippy because it, the performance really wasn't announced, and this was in the, uh, the brewery in that space, the, uh, um, the gallery space there. And so then all of a sudden, when all of these women dressed in black with black hair, all of Asian descent, would sort of come together. <laughs> you know, people would say, "What's going on?" <laughs> you know, and then they would just band again. It was uh, like a twilight zone. It was really nice. So, um, and and I guess I did a lot of sort of different things, but um, but now I just wanted to show you this piece from a series. I was doing a lot of artwork mm -hmm. where I was cutting uh, photogra photographs to sort of talk about the absence and presence. And when the Iraq War um, started, I started to collect the images or the initial part, not the whole, not the first year when it began until the moment that the Saddam Hussein's uh, statue was taken down. It's about a year, and I think they, at that moment they declared it the end, which wasn't the end. But I collected all the New York Times um, uh, uh, you know, publication. They have a whole section, I think, in the middle of war on terror or something. So I collected all the photographs, and decided to start cutting those as well. And what really ended up happening was really an interesting kind of juxtaposition of images and um, telepoetic um, things. And I really loved when, you know, when you cut out the soldiers. Oh, basically what I did was I cut out the soldiers from all the photographs, the newspaper, and what happened was when I cut out the photographs, and on the other side there's a crime, you know, a woman who lost her family during the war, so it almost the folks that are walking across the page of these stories. It's called a war, war cut. Um, oh. And then we um, went to Ghana. Todd and I went to Ghana, which is another long story and uh, <laughs> artist who just came back from our studio. We, started a residency program this year now, so artists are going there uh, to experience our um, 
being trapped. <laughs> and Lisa's going to yeah, uh, go in August next in August and that's how we met Lisa actually. So um, needless to say of course that experience of going to Africa and uh, building a studio home had really transformed my own view. And what I'm going to do is just show you a brief video, it's a very small clip, but um, sort of this is a, uh, we're, we're on this bus waiting for it to leave uh, for eight hours before it can fill up. So we have to sit in this bus for eight hours and it's kind of interesting because we have to sit, slow down and just observe. But I make this kind of fun video and I might sort of skip through, so let's see. But you can sort of see what's going on in this sort of bus depot, but also becomes a marketplace. There are people roaming. building everywhere in the U.S. 
as well as all over Asia and Dubai. And so I was thinking a lot about this human need to keep making, building. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of that was uh, in my uh, thinking as I was making a uh, few of these uh, installations. And the first one uh, that I made was for a 18th Street project, and then it traveled to the UC Riverside Swinging Valley. And um, what I did was I made a connection between our life in Inglewood and our life in Ghana. And it's, you know, the, this very Christian, heavy Christian influence in, uh, presence in Ghana. And we, in Inglewood and in the West Bar, where we lived, had 10 churches in like four block distance. And right at the corner from our house was this um, church. Uh, where they had the door open, it was hot, and we had a free like, Sunday music every Sunday. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I got into it, and then, you know, so I thought about the music, the church music, and it turned out that the minister actually uh, of that church was from Ghana, who was from the American. And so I wanted to make this uh, installation piece that was connecting these two worlds, the, the music, the Christianity of Africa and, uh, and the Inglewood. So I made this installation here. Usually, funerals in Ghana goes on for about a, a week or over a week, and people spend like a whole year's wage on their funerals. Oh, it's right. very lavish, yeah, very elaborate event. Attic and things like that. So I just 
um, you know, like a bunch of those and just created a tower in the gallery space. And there's a couple of it, a couple of uh, video projections. Um, the the green screen, the green uh, plexiglass actually, so it's a translucent. You see from both sides is an image, a photo, um, video I made from Dubai Airport, which is a very surreal kind of an experience. And then, um, then another video on the wall is a just driving through Dick's Cove, which you will go through on the way to our um, our our little um, uh, place. Uh, is a very it's a very it's, it's a seaside fishing village, but it's very dense. So it's almost like a, it feels like a city, small city, but it's so dense and it's kind of dirty. And, but just driving you know, through that street is such a, a, a crazy experience. You love that experience, or like you'd be horrified by it. <laughs> <laughs> Carolina, 
And it's one of my favorite pieces because it's so um, really pretty. It's, uh, it's a mosaic tile embedded into a concrete floor. And it took like four months to install. <laughs> but um, the, this abstract drawing, though, actually represents the hurricane map of North Carolina. So it has a very specific uh, um, meaning. But you don't know that if you just see it. Then I have a little circle somewhere that indicates where Miss and Salem is in that map. So it was really fun to install and have people come up to me and tell me, oh, when that happened, I was there, or my experience. So it really, in a way, evokes a lot of uh, memories for people when they understand me, the artwork. But also, it's really clean. <laughs> it's a really wonderful visual. It's an art center. Part of art school, they have an art school, they have also a theater, performance space, convention kind of a space. This is a piece done for um, San Bernardino, a rapid transit uh, project, and this was a site where there was a, um, there is a uh, National Orange Fair. It's, that's, there's still a lot of rock concerts going on there, but that was traditionally very important. Um, location in terms of the music industry, but then Bernardino is one of the earliest um, communities where the orange farming in Southern California happened, and actually it exists because of orange farming. So I wanted to refer back to that um, orange uh, farming, and also that convention center is used, uh, started as a orange convention to location. I saw Jimmy. I saw the Jimmy Hendrix experience there. Oh yeah. 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 My second rock show. <laughs> How old are you? No, I'm afraid. Chicago uh, Red Line Station. I wanted to create uh, an art, artwork that celebrates the architectural history of Chicago. So I took the photos of the houses and buildings on the street where this lo uh, the station is located, and then create this photo collage, um, a mosaic uh, mural collage. The lighting is actually it's a little um, too bright because there was no light at the time. It was all broken, so I had to. And it doesn't look very good. It's better looking now. <laughs> we'll to go back and document it. Some details, it's beautiful uh, glass mosaic. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's a piece in Laguna Beach. It was installed last year, and it was the idea was to create a pocket park on a sidewalk. <laughs> so this is what it looked like, and I thought it was fun to show it before and after. And I really mean, actually, it's a very, in a way, humble kind of a location, or a great location. It's a great location, but I really love that you create this little sanctuary in the middle of the traffic, you know, the stuff that people can sit there. And it's right in front of Whole Foods, so people eat lunches there and stuff. So I cut the um, planters down, so it's a little bit more welcoming, and the edge of it can become a sitting, and it made it circular at the end. And then the line, the whole sides of it, sort of creating geometric kind of um, shapes on the side, which if you took a long time, longer than I thought. And then lining the tops of the planter and the stools, this is the metal portion of it, with a mosaic. That, um, so all the patterns come from the tight pools of the Laguna Beach Bridge.
for interactive eight LED that we wanted. It's a um, cloud and rain. And in this angle, you can't really see, but the rain, the, the columns are meant to be the raindrops, and it's very um, to the angle from a different angle. The tops are um, cloud, and the the words cut into the discs are different water cycle, different states of water. So sleet and ice and hail, what you know, rain, all those different words. And then at night, um, there's this LED light component that sort of comes out as a rain, rainfall. Oh. You know, it's very uh, and 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 the, and the light itself also the level of the raindrop is um, controlled by the water tank water level in the water tank, rainwater reservoir of the ground. That's a very interactive selfie uh, spot. That's <laughs> <laughs> our little Chris Bird in the black mode. <laughs> <laughs> junior high school when I was living 
learning Chinese that this character is it represents humans because by yourself you can't stand alone, but together when you lean on against each other, you can stand. So I thought, oh, it's so beautiful. So I create, decided to create an artwork of two figures leaning on each other. Uh, and um, it looks like it from the other side, actually. It's on top of a building, so it has a street presence. And the letters uh, that are carved into the um, figures are taken from the temple, which had moved to a different location. People put out their wishes and hang it on the lantern. They pray to it, and it comes true. So I have a Chinese and English translation of those wishes. And that might. So that's a couple of projects I'm working on right now. Mosaic project for El Cerrito. And a BART station in Northern California. And a um, sculpture that will have a, I don't know who could render it comes here with the building and just a sculpture or model, but it will be placed in front of the, this new uh, Netflix building on Sunset Boulevard. Mm -hmm. It will have a LED, sort of the sculpt surface of the sculpture will become a media screen and a video will be produced in our studio, inspired by the film that was made there. So, thank you, that's it. Weeks, um, 
I don't think we want to do that. <laughs> so, but that could have been why I have more um, out spaces outside. Okay. And then the other question I have is the, the project you did where you photographed people who looked like you, mm -hmm. um, it made me think of this maybe sense of like the homogenized other or one ethnic group from the kind of Exactly. Yeah, of course. I say, yeah, oh, you look like somebody, or that uh, kind of comment. You know, it's annoying. But I also started yeah. to look and say, do I really look like you know another person? I thought, well, yes, maybe similar hairstyles, similar features, similar skin tone. So also it had to do with I was dating Todd, and I started to actually also I started noticing black men around the city. So oh, he looks like Todd, or he looks like Todd. <laughs> Art in that sort of big spectrum of life also is focused 
sort of endeavor that I'm doing. And I feel like I make art to have an experience, which is a uh, aesthetic experience, a beautiful experience. Creative uh, process itself is part of that. It's like, oh, I made this, this new thing, and it's really cool, and I feel so good because it was an aesthetic experience I had that day making this discovery. So um, I think the, I think the reason I talked about at the beginning, my practice and studio, studio practice was, I felt like it was very selfish and that it was really about my aesthetic experience. And then it sort of gets shared by with people when I have an exhibit or you know, share with other people. But what I love about public art is that my focus is shifting a little bit and I am really looking at, uh, looking uh, to create that for the public in a way. And it might not be successful, I'm sure it's not successful always, however, shifting that focus has been a tremendous sort of um, opportunity to grow, to grow as an artist, to think differently. And so that's been, I mean, I'm still trying to figure it out, really, but um, so it's been maybe the common thread, but also a huge a gift in my um, experience. The second question, um, I think I, uh, it was a, not, it wasn't a conscious decision really, but I had a year, I've been teaching for 12 years since graduate school, and I had um, a little grant and uh, also a good-sized public art project about seven years ago, so I decided to take her, give myself a sabbatical. And, and then I really liked just being at the studio full-time, <laughs> and I thought, how do I make that happen? And I thought, oh, maybe I'll make more public art. So it's sort of one by one, it happened, and then I sort of like not, I, I like being selfish and just thinking about my, my own art and not the students, which I sometimes do. <laughs> <laughs> they take up a lot of your brain and space, right? So it sort of happens slowly, and then after three, four years, it's like, oh, I don't think I'm not really bad at teaching. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to add to that because we've had conversations about the studio practice and, and, the, and then situating work in the public and we've talked about it as a gift and I, I think of it as a compassion, you know, because that was a solipsistic, a little too harsh, but you know, we're so centered in our, in our own perception and our own existential uh, milieu and thus the work reflects that or our own in, in, intellectual Rubens cube that we keep turning and turning and trying to make sense of it. But then when we get out of that sensibility, I mean, it's really a gift to um, communicate and go, hey, I, I wanna, I, I wanna, ah, maybe that's a communicate, but uh, we've talked a lot about it being a gift and how can we make this the best gift possible, still maintaining our art credibility, not art credit, but still, I don't know what the proper word is, Linda, but do you know what the proper word is? Sensibility is good, Linda. I was just thinking also the fluency of dealing with a commission and still having a beautiful project with life force at the, at the end result, that itself is an art. Like, that's compassion, too. I know what the word I was looking for. Still maintaining and evolving our language. Mm -hmm. That's the word I was looking for. So the art language is there, the one is evolved. The gift is there, and then you've done, you've uttered the art language in such a way that it's just not those who are influenced with art, but those who are just human ass beings. <laughs> <laughs> you, do, normally, do you have a break, or when do you want to? Uh, yeah, we have a break. Uh, like a three minutes? To, well, I'll ask you. Because I was here once before, and they said, oh, I have a five minute break. It's like 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and what places to go? So, do you guys need a, a, a three minute or do you want to just keep rolling? How many roll? How many roll? 